Hello and welcome to this video on how to optimize your images and how to acquire your images. My name is Andras and let's get started. So I'll be using a lot of slides and a lot of information published in this paper. So this is a guideline from the ASC, American Society of Echocardiography. This is freely available on the internet. It's full of useful and good information. So if you're interested in more of an in-depth explanation on how to do your image optimization, I would really recommend for you to read this, download it, read it, watch the videos. And um, I'll be using a lot of things from this article. Let's talk about acoustic windows first. As you know, the heart is behind bone and lungs and we are unable to image through these structures. So we need windows, acoustic windows to find images uh, of the heart. And these acoustic windows, as depicted here in the ASC document, you have the parasternal area and all these windows are really areas so large broader areas where you really have to move your probe around a little bit and try to find the best image that you can find so it's hard to say that it's just one spot and then you'll get a perfect image from that you really have to meander through and then trying to uh, move your probe up and down right left and for that reason it's very important to be aware of the different axes and different planes that we're using uh, for imaging the heart. The whole echocardiography and the images and the sequence of images it's fairly standardized and the actual images that you take they, they should be as close to the standard optimal image as, as you can make it so that we can compare images from the same patient and um, in the cardiac lab, for example, uh, the standardization is, is very important. So we'll start usually with the long axis plane where you're cutting through the heart through its long axis. And as you see here, so you're starting with the aorta. Behind it, there'll be the left atrium. Most anterior structure is your right ventricle and behind it is the left ventricle. So this is your long axis plane. When you're looking at the short axis plane, you'll see that we just have to rotate our probe and then we're cutting through the heart in its short axis. So the LV becomes a round circular structure and the RV will be around it as a semicircular or round uh, or crescent shape structure and when you're look, looking at the apical plane so you place your probe on the apical beat or where the apical is or should be and then you're imaging all the way through the heart in that apical plane meaning that you're cutting through all four um, all four chambers, the right ventricle, left ventricle, and the two atria. So this would be your apical plane. Very important is to notice where your image orientation marker is on your ultrasound probe. Usually it's a, a little dot or a ridge or a light or something very noticeable on your ultrasound probe. And this will correspond to one side of your image. Echocardiography, by convention, the image orientation marker is always on the right hand side of the image. Abdominal imaging, for example, would be different and it's the opposite. The or image orientation marker will be on the left hand side. So this is why it's important to always make note of where your image orientation marker is and which side of the screen that will correspond to. I mentioned that we'll have to move our probe on the chest to find the best possible quality images. Uh, so we, we need to know 
how we move our probe on the chest and different terms are used for this and different people will mean different things by these different terms and and I'm as guilty as anyone else sometimes I I use these terms loosely interchangeably but we shouldn't really and the ASC guidelines they uh, describe these movements and I think we'll have to adopt these recommendations so let's see what we can do with the probe so movement means that uh, you move the actual probe foot pin, footprint on the chest wall tilting is when the probe the tail goes up and down angulation is when the probe tail goes right or left and rotation is when the footprint stays in one spot and then you actually rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. So the ASC document is describing the tilting that you leave your probe footprint in one location. So you're staying on that apical location with your probe and then you move your tail up or down meaning that the actual ultrasound beam will move the opposite direction down or up so really this is moving the probe and the ultrasound beam in the anterior to posterior uh, axes and we are still always in the apical plane so let's see what happens so first if your probe is looking upwards so most anterior first you'll see the pulmonary valve so this can only happen if the patient has exceptionally good anatomy and easy and, and very good images you start looking slightly more posterior so you're gonna start seeing the fifth chamber and the apical five chamber view which is the iota and the LVOT so you'll find the apical five chamber view and then if you look slightly more posterior you will end up with the apical four chamber view and then if you if you look slightly even more posterior then in the AV groove you're gonna start seeing more posterior structures like the coronary sinus so this is what we mean by tilting Rotation is relatively easy, so for example from the personal long axis view you'll find that with a clockwise rotation you turn into the personal short axis view, so this is relatively easy. Sliding the probe on the chest wall means that the actual footprint is moving in some direction and I learned this from a from a sonographer sometimes they refer to this as moving north and south and east and west so it's sometimes it's quite difficult to, to to know what you mean by going up or down or left and right who's left who's right is it yours is it the patient or you know it's it's quite difficult to to, to standardize all these movements so moving north south east and west so that that's that's quite quite a good um, way to describe how you're moving your probe on, on the patient chest rocking in the ASC guidelines they use this term for when your probe the tail of the probe is moving either towards the image orientation marker or the tail of the probe is moving away from the image orientation marker so what will mean for the image when you have for example the personal long axis image on your screen moving the tail away or towards the image orientation marker means that the actual image will move left to right or right to left um, on your screen meaning that you you want to center something that's already on the image then you do this 
angling. In the ASC document, angling is a, a complex move. For example, when you are in the parasternal short axis view and you're imaging the tricuspid valve and you want to move towards the pulmonary valve and you're changing your probe rotation orientation and everything to get that on the image it's a slight move however it involves a number of movements so you might have to move your probe up and down and right to left you might have to move uh, your tail up and down, your tail right to left, left to right. You might have to do slight rotation in one direction or the other. And then quite often all of the above you just do all at once and then a little bit of each of these and then that's how you're going to end up with um, finding a new structure in that same plane. So angling they use the term angling for this when you're combining all sorts of movements, little bits of movements to find a new structure. And sweep means that you're recording quite a long video, a long clip with many heartbeats and you're trying to sweep through different large portions of anatomical structures. So like what I did here, starting from the apex, I was moving up towards the base of the heart and then finding that ventricular septal defect right through to the middle. So look at the septum there. And as I move towards the base of the heart, septum disappears, large VSD is revealed. So this is a sweep. And all of the previous steps when you're trying to move your probe and trying to get the most optimal images than your standardized images and all of the next many slides that I'll be showing to you how to optimize your image, all of that really is serving one purpose so that you can get the best quality images either in a cardiac lab or in the ICU with pocus echoes and you're really trying to get the standard images so that you can do your measurements and you can do your uh, tracing of various surfaces and really you can only do that if you have the best quality image available to you. So, how do we get that best quality image? Let's see uh, controls, knobs and dials on your ultrasound machine. So this is a little bit of a knobology lesson. Let's start with the basics. Grayscale settings. On most ultrasound machines you can select various uh, grayscale maps, they call them. So it means that they just use different shades of gray and if you select one or another it gives you slightly different looking images. The actual information is really the same in both. However, uh, it, they just look slightly different in their shades of grays. When you look at the uh, color, colorful images, so they call them uh, B maps or, or color maps, you can select various colors, so warmer, redder images, or uh, colder or cooler blue images or even yellows or some other, some other colors might be available. It appears that some of our eyes would get better information from different colors. So some of us will prefer to look at red images, some of us would prefer to look at yellow images and then using different hues of that color, so yellows or blues or reds, we might be able to uh, appreciate smaller amounts of you know little differences in, in anatomical structures. 
the actual information again that's contained within these images, so gray scales or, or color maps, B maps, it's the same. So it doesn't give you more information, doesn't give you better resolution. However, the different hues of different colors may uh, may look better for you and may you may uh, prefer to look at those structures in these different colors. Dynamic range is a setting that you can change. Sometimes they call it compression in some ultrasound machines. High dynamic range means that from full black to full white you have many 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 different uh, grades so getting from white to black so it means that you have many many different grays many many dif many many different shades of grays and that gives you a much smoother image as you see in the upper image there so this is a high dynamic range with a smoother looking image low dynamic range on the other hand is much shorter in that scale from getting from white to black so there's a lot less grades be between the two uh, a lot less shades of gray used so the actual image will become a bit dottier whiter and, and blacker so it means that with low dynamic range you will find a much grainier high contrast image so when, when your image quality or the patient anatomy is not very easy, uh, we would recommend a low dynamic range setting. When your image quality and patient anatomy is much more favorable, then a high dynamic range setting will give you a much nicer looking smoother image. When you have the option to select probe frequencies, then we would always recommend to select the highest possible frequency for your transmit frequency, that's the probe frequency. And think back to the physics lecture, high frequency means better resolution. Um, as you move along your image images and you're, you're selecting uh, your frequencies, the probe frequencies, you really have to change frequencies quite often as you move from a parasternal image to, a, to an apical image and so on. So when you're changing your depth and for an apical image you will require a much bigger depth, meaning that you might have to sacrifice that uh, high frequency as you uh, go along your scanning and that means uh, that as you move on to your next image you just have to change all these settings so that you optimize the image for the actual image that you're taking. Harmonic imaging, usually harmonic imaging is used in most modern ultrasound machines. The physics behind it is, is quite complex but most modern systems they emit in your base frequency so that's your transmit frequency these the sound waves will penetrate the tissues and they will generate the echoes but not only uh, from that base frequency they're gonna be producing echoes in the multiples of that base frequency as well at, at the same time and the higher the frequency with the receiving signal the better the image quality so these modern ultrasound systems they use the fundamental fundamental frequency to transmit into the tissues and then they're gonna use the uh, harmonic frequency to get the information back from the tissues. So they're going to be listening in these multiples of the base frequency and they're going to be listening uh, in that and that's going to give you a nicer 
image. As you see here, fundamental imaging and the difference when you use the, the harmonic imaging, you get a better uh, resolution, you're getting finer anatomical structures and you will get uh, a better quality image if you use your harmonic imaging. Quite often this is autom automatic, so the ultrasound systems will use this and they give you the better looking images. Depth, I mentioned depth many many times during the previous lectures. You really have to keep your depth at the minimum. Depending on what you're imaging, you don't want to waste most of your screen, most of your computing power um, to, to look at something that you're not interested in. So you should always use the minimum depth and the minimum depth meaning that where, whatever you're looking at that should be centered on your screen and there shouldn't be too much behind it so that you're not wasting your ultrasound machine computing power. Focus position and the focal zone really. So we should always uh, change the settings according to what we are looking at. So for example, if you are more interested in the mitral valve area, then you set your focal zone into that depth. If you're more interested in the apical um, area and you're looking for an, an apical thrombus, then you set your focal zone for that. Um, that's really just to improve your chances to, uh, to, to identify various abnormalities and really to get the best resolution for that part of the image. Overall gain, you should set your overall gain so that blood field structures like ventricles, atria, large vessels should be echo free. So I think this lower image is, is a little bit over gained here, as you see, so that it looks like there might be something in that left atrium. However, that's really not the case. Uh, it's just a slightly over gained image. So you should always reduce your gain so that all chambers, blood filled chambers, they all appear black and there's no speckles in them. TGC is another form of gain um, where you try to make similar anatomical structures look similar anywhere on that image so any any depth uh, myocardium should look roughly the same and that you can achieve by adjusting your TGC or time gain compensation so it's just various areas of the screen you can increase or reduce or increase or reduce the gain uh, in those various areas uh, on your screen and you're trying to achieve the consistent appearance of those similar structures. Autogain is a, is a good function especially if you're starting out your uh, echo journey and you're a bit overwhelmed with all these dials and knobs so you can just press auto gain and it gives you the best uh, possible image and um, as you move along your your studies and you you learn how to um, optimize your images it might get easier with time but to start out you might use the auto gain function zoom is an important feature where you want to do some measurements and you're trying to again optimize your images for that important measurement that you're trying to make so you select an area on your screen 
and then you press zoom and it gives you a better image uh, smaller uh, sector meaning better frame rate and you're gonna get a more accurate measurement from that image so there's two types of zoom as you see so you have your right zoom which is happening as you take the images so it means that each pixel will represent a smaller area and that's a real zoom so it gives you a better uh, resolution for that measurement the read zoom on the other hand it's like when you're pinching in and out on your tablet so it doesn't really give you a better resolution and in fact it will give you a poorer apparent resolution it's just a simple magnification it doesn't um, improve the image in any way it just makes it bigger sector size again very important initially when when you are finding the actual images it's good to to keep your sector quite large so that you know where you are however when you start looking at different structures you might want to change your sector size larger and smaller so that you uh, you are a bit more selective on what you're looking at so you just want to look at the left ventricle or you just want to look at more the left atrium so you, you you change your sector size according to what you're actually imaging and the sector width has a very very uh, significant effect on your frame rate and how choppy your loop or cine loop uh, will be so you live you really have to keep your sector width as uh, narrow as possible but still uh, showing you everything that you'd like to look at on that image okay let's move on to how to optimize your doppler and spect spectral doppler images so we talked about uh, aliasing a lot uh, throughout the, the last uh, lectures. So when some parts of the uh, spectral display are cut off and they displayed in the wrong area. So this is just your ultrasound machine telling you that um, it's unable to process the information correctly. So how do you uh, reduce the aliasing? You can change your scale so look at look here so the scale is set here uh, 0.8 meters per sec and then if you change your scale to 1.2 meters per sec uh, it will uh, get rid of that aliasing sweep speed it's quite an important feature especially in the focus world where you'd like to compare what's happening uh, in various phases of the respiratory cycle so inspiratory flows versus expiratory flows throughout various valves so that is your sweep speed setting so when you set your sweep speed high 100 millimeters per second your LVOT VTI will be big so when you want to measure it when you want to trace it you set your sweep speed rather high when you'd like to check what's happening with those LVOT VTIs across the respiratory cycle, first of all, you put your respirometer tracing, so expiration, inspiration, and then you set your sweep speed rather low, 25 millimeters per second. So it means you will be able to see a lot more cardiac cycles on your screen so that you can compare what's happening in various phases of, of, of the breath. We talked about the spectral Doppler and how it looks. You have your modal velocity, you have your spectral window here and this image is not very fuzzy and this is a well optimized uh, pulsed wave Doppler image. On the other side, you see how it's much wider. There's the, the spectral window is not very clear in the middle and it's fuzzier and uh, you, you're, you're just not sure what's happening there. Compare the sizes of the sample volume. 
So see here, the sample volume is much bigger. You're sampling from a much larger area. It means that the red cells in that area have various velocities and all these various velocities are displayed here. So it's not very uniform, it's very white and messy. When you set your sample volume smaller, it means that you're sampling the, a much smaller area of uh, blood. It means that the re red cells will be more uniform in their motions. So your modal velocity will come out much nicer there and you're gonna have a nice area of spectral window in here. So it's all, all nice and black. That's your sample volume size. You can set this on the ultrasound machine yourself. Wall filter will get rid of all the low velocity signals near, near the baseline. So compare these three images here. See how this first one, you're, you're not, not quite sure when these things are starting and when it's really ending. So if you're trying to eliminate these low velocity signals close to the baseline, then you might be able to identify the start and finish of these uh, areas on your spectral Doppler display. So when, when the actual start or and finish is there, so you, you'll be able to do measurements more accurately. Shouldn't set it too high though, because then if you if you get rid of too much information around the baseline, then again you you won't be able to do the measurements accurately. Spectral Doppler gain, as we discussed during your overall gain settings, there's a there's a knob or dial there for your spectral display gain and over gaining and under gaining can occur in that one. So if you look at the images here, you we're taking some images from the pulmonary vein. When it's too high, your gain is set too high. It's very fuzzy. It's all very white, white and then you, you don't really know what's going on. When it's under gained, again, you're losing a lot of information there. You, you, you don't see what, what is exactly is happening there. That's why an optimally set uh, spectral Doppler gain would be fairly important with a good spectral window, modal velocity and all of the above that we discussed previously. When you have aliasing, again, when some parts of this is cut off and displayed on the wrong side of the baseline, sometimes it's enough just to shift your baseline and you might be able to get rid of that aliasing just by that simple measure. So shifting your baseline might be the only thing that you have to do. The high pulse repetition frequency mode. This is something your ultrasound machine does where you set your sample volume, you're trying to set your sample volume here in your LVOT area and then because the velocities in that area are way too high the ultrasound machine is trying to help you in a way that it will set another two sample volumes along that scan line and it's going to display all of the information received from these three sample volumes so it will be able to display what's happening in your middle sample volume there so that's number two here but then you're gonna get the information from the other two sample volumes as well so number one as you see here you're gonna get a little bit of information from the pulmonary vein side and number three which is 
uh, inside the left ventricular cavity. So you're gonna get some information displayed of that as well. However, it's all very uh, ambiguous and you, it's displayed on the wrong side and in, in the wrong, wrong area of that spectral display. One way to get rid of all this is the reduce your depth. So depth would be uh, a very important setting in this one. Or you can switch from pulsed wave Doppler into a continuous wave Doppler setting. And that way, along the scan line, you're gonna get all the information displayed exactly where it should be. And since you know where the highest velocity uh, is in this image, so it's going to be somewhere in the aortic valve area, then you might not need that pulsed wave setting. You can just switch to continuous wave Doppler. The best way to do your various imaging where you use the, the presets. So each machine will have its own presets. It's, uh, the manufacturer will set these presets. Tissue Doppler imaging will be uh, using a larger sample volume size. It's gonna get your scale set at lower velocities and it's gonna be looking for high amplitude. And the actual display will be optimized for it, for that uh, tissue Doppler imaging. And you see how this bit here, it doesn't really look exactly the same. You can't, you, it's fuzzy, you, you don't know what's happening there. However, when, you, when you're using your presets, it's much more clearer and it's much easier to see what's happening. Sector size and color box size is again an important setting that will have an impact on your image quality. So initially it's okay to, to use a rather, a rather large color box size when you're, when, you're, when you're fishing around and you're trying to uh, find your best images. But as, as you move um, into a smaller area, you, you want to improve your image quality, you want to improve your frame rate. So you're setting your sector width or you're setting your color box size as small as possible. But again, uh, at the same time, you, you really want to include everything uh, what you want to look at, but at the same time you keep it as little as possible. So for example, when you're looking at that um, LVOT and when you're looking at uh, the blood flows through the LVOT, then you keep your sector width rather narrow and a bit longer so that you see the whole LVOT movement and that blood column that's moving, you can check all of that. And just compare the choppiness of these two images there. You see how uh, a smaller color box will give you a better 2D image and the large color box will really degrade your image quality in, even in, in, in the 2D image be behind your color box. Color Doppler gain. The ASC document and the guidelines recommend that when your color box is on, you slowly increase your color gain until you get spontaneous speckling in tissue where there shouldn't be any um, where there shouldn't be any any um, color box or, or, or any color f or any flow uh, display and then when that is occurring then you start slowly reducing it until it dis disappears and that's your optimal color doppler gain and Optimizing the color Doppler gain is important 
when you're imaging various flows inside a heart, sometimes you can't really see what's happening if your if your color Doppler gain is not set optimally. So, for example, here you can't really see uh, the pulmonary flows, and when you're uh, increasing the color Doppler gain, then suddenly you will identify those pulmonary flows. You can use uh, various color maps and again it means that uh, different hues of different colors will be used uh, for those um, blood flows and movements. Uh, the velocity we usually set between 50 to 70 meters per sec and if you use variance it means that turbulent looking flows will be assigned greens and shades of greens and yellows so it's just one way for us to to tell that uh, turbulent flow is occurring in that area otherwise you will just get that mosaic looking flow so when when there is a turbulent flow you'll get blues and reds right next to each other so the velocity scale settings are actually very important and the ASC document is recommending that for valve assessments you set your velocity scale between 50 to 70 centimeters per sec and if you're looking at low flow areas or lower flow areas for pulmonary veins and atria you set it around 30 centimeters per sec. And it will have a, a big effect on what's hap what, what you're looking at and what you're seeing. So if you change your velocity scale, it may just get rid of all these ambiguous areas. So see how here it looks like there might be some aliasing and some turbulent flow. But in, in fact, uh, it is not turbulent. It is a, a, a laminar flow. Your, the, the only problem was that your scale settings weren't set uh, right. If you don't set your velocity scale correctly, it will have a, a significant effect on how you are assessing various abnormalities. So for example, a mitral regurgitation jet, you can overdiagnose or underdiagnose it uh, depending on how you're setting your scale. See how here on the first image your scale is set low. So your mitral regurgitant jet looks enormous. It's filling up the whole left atrium. This is the same patient and the same MR jet. When you set your mitral regurgit when you set your velocity scale higher, it's gonna make your mitral regurgitant jet. It's gonna make it look much smaller. However, when you use your optimum and best setting it will give you the correct size of that mitral regurgitant jet so between 50 and 70 so this is not really a recommendation it's it's you you have to set your velocity scales between 50 and 70 because all of these assessments that we're going to describe later um, the size of uh, mitral regurgitant jet and, and all other valves as well so they all they've all been described for these velocity scale settings. When you're looking at lower flows, interatrial septum or uh, the atria, then you set your scale much lower. So you're going to use somewhere around um, 30 centimeters per sec. Compare the two images when you're setting 0.6 meters per sec you can't see much there's no flow at all it looks like there's no flow in these areas but when you set your velocity scale into that 30 centimeters per sec range suddenly you will find nice flow in both atria and this is how you assess the interatrial septum. When you're trying to optimize your M-mode images, 
all of the above applies to that as well. So you need to think about how you set your sweep speed, how you set your overall gain, that, that's your uh, 2D image overall gain, your TGCs, you'll have to um, think about that, even more so in this um, M-mode imaging, because you really want to make sure that um, some parts of the image, the fore or the, the uh, distant parts of the image, they not different, they not overgained or undergained. And all of these settings will have to be adjusted when you're taking your M-mode images. There's a feature called steerable M-mode. So when you set your M-mode and you set your cursor, but somehow your structures don't align well with that cursor line. Sometimes in some ultrasound machines there is an option to, to use a little part of that cursor line and then change the orientation of that cursor line so that you're trying to align it much better with the, uh, the actual structures. Well this is not really recommended and they recommend against using it simply because um, you, you really have to uh, make an effort to optimize your M-mode images as much as you can and if you're unable to uh, using the steerable mode is not gonna improve your M-mode image and it's, it's gonna just give you it, it's gonna give you the same amount of information as, as you get from the 2D image so really it's uh, not a good idea to use it. You might use color for the M-mode as well and we're gonna be describing some of these as we uh, as we're gonna be talking about the RV and LV assessments and various valve assessments. Um, same setting as what we described before, velocity scales and all of those will be important and the size of the color box, all of those you will have to change as previously described. So these were the uh, most important settings, knobs and dials that we need to change as we take our images and as I mentioned before each new image that you're taking from a long axis into a short axis into an apical into a subcostal so all of the previous settings and scales and dials and everything should be readjusted for that new image and as you learn how to do your echo images you really have to use more and more of these settings and more often really for each image that you're taking. So thank you for listening and I'll see you next time for our next talk.